Welcome to What's the Scoop? Communicating about your lab to colleagues and the public. My name is Ann Curtis. I'm the Director of Marketing Communications for the Medical School Office of Research. Just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, I spent the first half of my career in the private sector. I was a marketing and event manager for a company here in town called ProQuest. And then um, I was a private consultant for a while, and then I landed here in the business development group that's part of the Office of Research at the medical school. And actually a little, little digression, the medical school Office of Research, in case you didn't know, is the organization that oversees many of the operations and infrastructure aspects of research at the medical school. So for instance, the core labs, the biomedical research core facilities are a part of the Office of Research. Mishar, who our friend Jamie is with us today, Mishar is a part of the Office of Research. Organizations like IRB Med are also a part of the Office of Research. So I started with the business development team in, in the Office of Research. Let me just say it one more time. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, about two years ago, I moved into a role as the marketing director for all of the activities for the whole uh, Office of Research organization. So that's a little bit about me and why I'm standing up here. I'm going to now toss the ball to our colleagues on the panel sure. so they can tell you about Great. themselves. Hi, everybody. I'm Kara Gavin. I've been at the university for about 16 years now. Um, I am in the Department of Communications for the Health System, which covers the hospital and the medical school, so the whole ball of wax. I am currently pretty much the only one of our seven media relations folks assigned um, to full-time to research specifically. All my colleagues cover research at some time, but a lot of them are focused on clinical care as well. I am focused on the basic sciences and our Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation. So that's, I sort of split my world between the health policy world and the, the lab world. Uh, and uh, But like I said, there are seven of us at the health system who do what I do in trying to get the research that goes on here out to the world. Um, but I'm so glad we could do this session because there's a lot you all can do individually as well or as labs um, to do that too. So uh, before I was here, I was at Brookhaven National Lab in New York uh, and I trained in science writing at Lehigh and Columbia. Hi, my name is Molly Kleinman. I'm very new in the, my current role here, which is uh, I work for the Medical School Information Services and we have a very small group dedicated to uh, what we call learning design and publishing. And there's sort of a learning design side, which includes instructional technology, um, focused mostly on on, on the education side of the mission, but also we have a podcast studio that I'll be telling you about. And then also um, the publishing side. So we publish books and open access journals, open educational resources, and we provide all kinds of consulting services for people who want to learn more about how to get their work out into the world in various ways. Uh, my background is that I have a master's degree in information science from the University of Michigan. Uh, before that, I worked in publishing, um, just sort of trade publishing in Manhattan. After that, I worked as copyright specialist here at the University of Michigan Libraries for several years, and I'm now working on my own PhD as well in the School of Education. So I have a very, very in your spare time. <laughs> in my spare time. Yep. Yeah. So, speaking of which, so. To start, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the overall communications landscape here at the University of Michigan. So there are hundreds of communicators here at the U. I don't know if you knew this, it's a little crazy. In fact, this morning, um, there was a meeting of a group that's called the Communicators Forum. And when you go to that meeting, the first time you go to it, as I did five years ago, and I sat in the ballroom at the Michigan Union and saw 300 people sitting around me. I was like, who are all these people? Why, why are there 300 communicators and why, why do I never see any of them? And, and part of that is because we, as with many things at the university, communications is very decentralized. So to give you an idea of, of how it works though, sort of at the highest level, we have um, these four groups that I wanted to call out. Um, at Central Campus, we have the Office of the University of Michigan Vice President for Global Communications. They're the ones who, who do everything that you see that is branded with the big block M, and, and they do the Michigan difference. They were a part of that with the development group. I mean, they're, they're responsible for getting the students here and making the world know how wonderful the University of Michigan is. Um, here at the health system, we have the UMHS Department of Communication. So under that umbrella is all communications at, again, a high level that have to do with both the hospital and the medical school. 
Right. Does that Correct. pretty much sum it up, Carol? Correct. And then there's my own office, my own group, which is the Medical School Office of Research Marketing Communications Group. And we're a fairly tiny group, again, that serves those activities that are strategically aligned with our research mission and also those core operations that I discussed, um, like the core, like our business development group, that sort of thing. And then finally, another one I wanted to call out was, was Molly's group, which is the Health Sciences Publishing Services group, which is a part of MSIS. There's a lot of, lot of people doing a lot of marketing and a lot of communications, but what I find encouraging is I think the, those of you who are here recognize that you can be communicators too. You are a part of that ecosystem that is about communicating Michigan excellence, Michigan innovation, you know, all of those things that you sort of bundle up and that we know are, are what's good about Michigan. So again, saying sort of at a higher level, I wanted to ask the question, you know, what does it mean to be Michigan? What is it to be the University of Michigan? And actually, uh, a couple of years ago, the VP for Global Communications, their office did a huge survey. They surveyed students, they surveyed alumni, they surveyed faculty and staff, they surveyed people who, who didn't attend Michigan or who had never worked here. And what they were asking is, what do you think about when you hear the University of Michigan? What, what does that mean? What images come into your mind? And they ended up sort of distilling the results of the survey into three big areas. And I think the first one is not going to surprise you. That's our academic prestige. I mean, right? I mean, we, we know that. We are proud to be here. I actually have, out of um, their data, their bullet points, I pulled out specifically, you know, we are a, a globally, actually they wrote nationally, but I know that we're a globally recognized research institution. Um, I don't know if you saw just last week, uh, it was Reuters who came out mm -hmm. that said we're the number five mm -hmm. most innovative, most innovative university academic institution Based in the on world. Publications and patents. Based on publications and patents, right? So, so we, we have a lot to be proud of and, and it's not, that's recognized outside of our own community. People see that, that prestige. The other big area that really sort of floated to the surface with this survey was the public ethos. You know, it's, it's we're out there doing good in the world. Um, actually, this picture that, um, that I put on the slide, that's actually our OBGYN group in Ethiopia as part of the medical school's global reach program. People within and people without recognize that the activities that we're doing, the things that we're doing, the education, the research, the things that we're doing is a thing for good. And so that really, that really resonates with everyone. And then finally, the third major area that comes to mind when people think about the University of Michigan is, is our history and our tradition. How, how many people here knew that in 2017, it's our bicentennial? How many people, anybody? Yeah, 200 years. Now, you know, for, for the United States, for America, that's a long time. And it's a, it's a super illustrious history. Um, so that's something that really is a part of what people think of when they think about Michigan. I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit now here just for a second about when I was in the private sector. I worked for a company called ProQuest and we sold research materials and databases to libraries and librarians for use in public libraries, research institutions, that sort of thing. And when I was in the marketing department for that group, one of the things that I loved about my job was we used to say, we're not selling cigarettes to kids. We're not selling guns to nut jobs in South Carolina. Not that I have anything against people from South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> but we were really doing something that had a positive impact in the world. It was, it was for profit, but it, it was a positive impact. And we were working together with our customers, the librarians and libraries to do good things. Well, then I came here to the University of Michigan and I'm working here in the Office of Research at the medical school. I mean, talk about a position that helps you do something that's good for the world. I am, I am proud every day that I'm here 
to help our researchers and help you package a very positive product for the outside world. We have an awesome product here. So, so I just, I want everybody, we're gonna talk a little bit about that and what our product is like and how we, we can protect it and protect that image. That's sort of a, a little story I wanted to talk to you and segue into um, this whole idea of the power of the brand. We talked about sort of all that background, good karma that's going on with how people view the University of Michigan. So what that translates into for us is the power of our brand. It, it's, it's good, it's good stuff. So what I would say to you, as you all are communicating things, is make sure you use that, leverage it. Don't, don't, don't cast it aside or don't downplay it. I mean, we were, we were in a session one time and I asked the person afterwards who was presenting why they didn't have their department logo or the block M on their slides. And they said, well, we didn't want it to seem like just another run of the mill University of Michigan presentation. And I was like, ah, ah, there's nothing run of the mill or ordinary about being at the University of Michigan. And internally, externally, we should always be, be proud of that. God, I'm coming off like a cheerleader, but there's power in it. Right, and there's credibility. That's the biggest thing you lose if you are not leveraging the big black M. Is is you're you're losing all that instant credibility of all that goodwill. So having said that, as we sort of now discuss some of the things and some of the ways that you might communicate with your your audiences, um, I just want to talk to you a little bit, um, sort of in the weeds about protecting the brand the way that we do. Um, and this information is going to be, um, oh, I was going to flip through here too, sorry. Totally, totally got ahead of myself. That's, <laughs> I, was, I was just in the moment. So, so again, going back to the power of the brand, look at, look at the big block M that is it, that's so recognizable. So don't, don't ever, you know, not use that to your advantage. Oh, this is a really good slide. Um, this is Dean Munson at a conference. What's the biggest thing you see on that screen behind him? Black M. It's the big block M, right? He recognizes it. He recognizes the credibility, you know, that that brings when when he is out in the world talking to people. So um, this URL that I'm going to pull up here, this is uh, for the VP of Communications Office. It's their style guide and um, logo guidelines. So this is where I want to sort of uh, bring you into this realm with us of sort of protecting the brand. There is really not truly a logo police. Nobody's gonna swoop into your lab and take your laptop from you if you are, mis are, are not using the logo in a way that, that we would expect you to or that respects the brand. Um, but having that in mind, we just wanna sort of give you some ideas of as you are using the logo and as you are putting it on your PowerPoints or you're putting it in, um, you know, papers or things like that, to, to just respect the M. So these are, these are super easy. It's like, don't retype things. God forbid, don't use Comic Sans ever, <laughs> right? Um, don't distort, don't do goofy things. This is my favorite one. All of these are up on the VP of Communications websites. It's like, don't add cartoons to the logos and the graphics. I mean, you would not, I mean, if you had a BMW, would you put 20 bumper stickers on the back of it, right? No, you, you, want, you want to be able to enjoy and love that powerful machine that you have put so much money into. You don't stick, a, stick an ugly, you know, I don't know, Hello Kitty bumper sticker on, on the back of your BMW. So, so again, this is, this is where, again, encourage you to use the brand and encourage you to use it in your communications. So you're in your lab, you're at your desk, you're wherever you're at, and you've got something in your head, something's going on that you know you should be communicating about. So before you jump to tactics, before you jump to let's schedule a room for an event, before you, you jump to, you know, let's call FedEx so we can get a poster printed, um, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about where you should start and the things that you should ask yourself 
before you jump straight to the printer. Um, you should ask yourself and you should talk with your leadership about what are the objectives? What have you got going on that you even think you need communications for? Are you looking for new funding? Um, is there, has your lab done something that's totally new and unexpected that you wanna to communicate to the, to the public, to the lay world? Um, do, you, do you maybe have a new service, right? Do you need to tell people about a new service that you have? Maybe you have a piece of equipment. I mean, what, why do you need to do this communication? What, what's your objective? So, so make sure you're clear about that because sometimes the tactic that you jump to is not the right one for what your objective is, right? If you've, if you've got a breakthrough that you wanna to communicate to the public, Having an event like this in the bowels of NCRC <laughs> might not be the right tactic to let them know about it, right? I mean, you can see that. I mean, I can hardly find this space, let alone. Um, but there's lots of reasons why that might not be the right thing. And then think about who your audience is. Again, that's important. It's like, who, who's your audience? Is it your colleagues? Um, is it the outside world? Is it staff or faculty here? Make sure you and your leaders, whoever is going to be holding your feet to the fire on this, are, are clear about what those are and who, who your audience is. The other big thing is around here, I mean, we're nonprofit, nobody has big bud, uh, budgets. You have to think about what are your resources and that's, that's budget and people. You know, it's, it can sometimes be a juggling act of both. So do you have money to pull in a freelance graphic designer? Do you have, if you're having an event, um, do you have the, can you line up the right speakers to be at that event? So that's sort of where we go with resources and then, Again, what's your timeline? Is it next month? Is it next year? That's always very important. And then finally, the thing that's hard even for professional marketers is how are you gonna measure your success? Make sure you've thought about that ahead of time. I mean, it may be as simple as, did we get the grant? Did we get the funding? I mean, that's a thumbs up, right? But you may need to look at things like, you know, what was the traffic to your website? How many people came to your event? How many clicks were there on the press release in PR news, right? I mean, those are the things that you need to, to have tried to sketch out ahead of time. You don't wanna do it on the other side. So, whew, okay, now I get to take a break. I'm gonna turn it over to Kara. She's gonna, again, talk about how things are different between audiences. Right. We're gonna go back to that audience thing. Right, so, right, so thinking about audience. So everybody thinks about the general public. Well, that's a lot of people and there's a lot of subdivisions within the general public. There's the science interested public. There's your colleagues in your subfield across the country or around the world. There's people in related fields that might not follow the literature in your subfield, but who might be interested in what you're trying to communicate. So I put together a few factoids about sort of the broader general public, what we think of as John and Jane public, if you will. Um, the folks you see at the grocery store, the folks you, um, you know, go to concerts with basically. And so we're talking about people who are not likely to have a lot of science knowledge. And frankly, if you talk about the broad public of the, university, of the United States as a whole, they're, even just their basic reading level uh, and comprehension level is not necessarily all that high. This might be startling to you, but we live in an ivy, ivory tower and a bubble of people who read at the 23rd grade level. But we have to remember that if we're going to think about the public, that means being able to speak in terms that reach people whose science education stopped in ninth grade or whose uh, education entirely stopped at 12th grade. And so that idea of, of making sure that we come at them if we're speaking to the public um, at those levels, not because their, their intelligence is inferior, it is not. It is their education level that allows them to help con um, process what you're telling them. But we do know that the public's really interested in science. So, so basically, we know that there are people out there. And what's amazing is how the internet has revealed that to us. I mean, people always used to subscribe to Scientific American or Discover or National Geographic, right? Well, now there's IFL Science, and there's you know all these different ways that people share science content on social media and on 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 the web. And this idea of people gravitating to science content is very real, and that's what is so powerful for us because. As I'll talk about in a minute, as we feed that appetite, we can get our information out there. But again, this idea of how much do they actually understand about the scientific process, about how science works, about how 
a result from a lab or a result from animals is not necessarily going to change the care they received from their doctor the next day. And that's a very important thing to understand is because you don't want to assume that they know that, oh, this is just a lab finding. This isn't going to reach clinical trials even for three or four years. They may not understand that. It's important to explain that so that their hopes do not get raised. So that's the kind of thing you have to think about, again, with the general public. Um, and, and frankly, there's some you know, uh, general explaining a very basic concepts that you've taken for granted since you were a freshman in college that they need to be reminded of. What is DNA? Is mental illness a biological thing or a moral failing? It, you know, those kinds of things that, that we have to explain along the way to make sure they understand what is accepted fact and what is understood and, and assumed by people in your world that they just don't even know to assume. And in general, they're getting it from the web, uh, the, the science information that they're looking for, if they're looking for it. And they're in general saying, yeah, science is doing good things. Science is benefiting society, but they also are very attuned to controversy and danger and risk and threat from science, especially if the news media decides to bring any of those possible threats or risks to their attention, or if their elected officials decide to. So I think that's always important to be attuned to as well. So the, the bottom line is that when we're communicating with public, and I write about research all the time, um, is that you're when you're writing for your scientific audiences, you're definitely trying to show them, here's how we did it, and here's our methods, and here's our population, and here's what we found. You're crystallizing it. For the public, it's all about get to the point at the start. Tell me what you found. Then tell me maybe about why it's important. Then, if I have time, I'll listen to how, how you did it. Because to them, A, their time is short. B, their, um, their interest you know, will wane as you go down that pyramid. And so this idea of, of crystallizing things and of, of bringing it into context to their world is very important. So um, let's see, this is the, oh yes, the idea of the, of the press release that overstates things by a long shot. I love this. this yeah, this so, is fun. So, so one of the things, um, I, does anybody, who watches Tiny House Nation or any of those Tiny House shows? I am totally, I am totally into Tiny House right now. So we, when we were talking about this session, we said, let's, let's give some people some examples of what might be communication tactics that they might need to have uh, to address and use in their own lives. So We've got a series now okay. of tiny case studies. So, so tiny case up. study Next. number one, big paper coming up. You just got accepted to name your dream journal, nature, cell, neuron, whatever, uh, PNAS, gamma. So basically you've just gotten accepted. You've just gotten the first email. Holy cow, great paper. This is going to be awesome for your career. You've been working on this work for five years. This is important. And you can say, all right, maybe we need to tell the world about this in some way other than in this very highly cited journal. Maybe we do need to think about getting this out to the world. And so I actually trust the guts of all of you for the most part. Um, I trust that you know what's a big deal in your field and what's not a big deal. I trust that you will come to us, PR people like me, when it truly, truly is a major advance, when it truly is something that, not just because of the journal it's in, it may be in a mid-tier journal because you really need to reach people in that subfield, but it's something that you are extremely proud of or that represents a huge body of work leading toward a major shift in, in, in the paradigm. Um, and so this idea of figuring out who you even contact, I'll have some resources for that at the end, but basically there are, there are two main offices here. As Ann said, there's the one for main campuses and the one for the med school. I'm in the one for the med school. So if you're med school, you could start with me, in all likelihood, it'll be me or one of my colleagues. If you're main campus, um, it's the U of M News Service, uh, Michigan News, they call themselves now. So basically, I always love to get those emails over the transom from a, a, a PI or a postdoc uh, uh, that says me something, hey, we just got accepted in Nature. And it's a paper that we're pretty proud of because we've discovered that X is true and we've done it in three different ways and we're, we think this has implications for disease Y and we think that this is going to be an important um, study for uh, the broader world to know about. So even if you give me a paragraph, and, and, and I speak relatively technical language, so you can give it to me in 20th grade level, um, you know, I, I will be okay with that. I will then never actually take what you've written and send it out. It would be something we work together to figure out what we're gonna do with it, how are we gonna convey this, uh, and is this the right time? And when I say this is the right time, obviously, whenever you get your acceptance email, it could be days, it could be weeks, it could be months until the paper is actually out, and I know that. And the publishing world has changed so much in the last 10 years 
about uh, how quickly things go from that initial email to it's online, either in corrected proof form or in final form. So basically, there's a, there's a judgment call that happens. There's a judgment call on your part to say, I'm going to reach out to PR people. And there's a judgment call on my part or my colleague's part of, is this something I can turn into a piece of news? And there may be times when we say, it's going to be hard to explain this, or let's wait till you have another you know, piece of evidence behind this, or do you have a clinical trial starting? Let's wait until you start that trial so that we can get you know, people starting to enroll and, and communicate about that and talk about the work as part of that. So, but let's say we say, let's go for it. Okay, so you've gotten accepted by nature. They've told you that once you get the final um, corrections back to them, it'll be two weeks before it goes online. Just hypothetical. This is actually a situation I'm dealing with right now. Um, so we've got those two weeks. And that's enough time to have a conversation and interview with me and maybe you and your PI or whatever. And then for me to start writing something that you guys then get to review. And then theoretically, if we get this all done within the next week and a half or so, three or four days before the paper actually goes online, there's this magical thing called the embargo period. And the journals all do this. They all actually play this game every week, every month. They allow PR people and their own press operation, if they have one, to issue news stories to reporters on the scout's honor that those reporters will not broadcast, print, or post on the web anything about that paper until the day and hour that the journal specifies. So if you ever wonder why you turn on NPR every Tuesday night and you hear what's in JAMA that week, or you turn on Thursday and you hear what's in science that week, that's why, because JAMA and science are among those that have set a very robust system for allowing journalists to have advanced access and allowing PR people to do advanced reaching out to reporters so that those stories can actually compete against the story about Taylor Swift and the story about the Pope and the story about um, the Kardashians and get onto the air. I mean, because that's what's really happening in newsrooms is that reporters who are attuned to health and science are having to lobby for the, for the airtime or the print space or the web space to get to cover that story. And the, the embargo system actually helps that happen. Um, so basically, then, once that embargo period is happening, you can actually give interviews about your work. You can actually um, possibly even get called about another person's work that's under embargo, where a reporter needs a comment from somebody else in the field and is going to share the paper with you, again, Scout's Honor, and say, what do you think of this? Is this a load of tripe? And you can say, well, actually, it's very interesting work, but I, they forgot to do this. And so that you become the second quote in their story. Um, so that idea of what can happen during the embargo period is actually um, pretty set in stone, and I can guide you through it if we're ever in that situation. But the other idea is that whatever I write, whatever we call our press release, our news release, um, it acts as a guide for you as uh, how to shape your quotes. And you'll see, if you ever go through this, that, that it is in very much lay, lay terms, and it's very much in plain English, but it still is scientifically accurate, and that we have to make sure of that because it goes out there and represents our brand. And there are actually watchdogs watching press releases from universities and journals and saying, so are they overstating these results? Are they hyping? Um, so we are very, um, very dogged about that. I have a, a cartoon that's outside the room. I hope you picked it up on the way in or pick it up on the way out that sort of diagrams this process. Hang it up in your lab and that maybe could be your trigger to, to call us when you do have um, something interesting. Like uh, example number two. So this one is also yours, Kara. Oh, okay. That's okay. I know. So, take, a, take a breath. Like I'm going so, grant. It's hers. Uh, yeah. No, so okay. no. The, so this one mm. is the grant we're applying for okay. requires a lay summary. Right. So that happens a lot, right? So you've got, you know, it says, oh, and we describe in two paragraphs what you would do with this money in plain English. So this is something that I, basically we put together a website that will give you a lot of resources for how to do that how to get the jargon out, how to use, um, don't use passive voice, not to be and is and are, and it's it's using active verbs to make it engaging to the public. Um, things like making sure that you're, you're just avoiding those words that are not in everyday parlance or that are used differently by lay people. Robust to you is something good. Robust to a lay person is a way to describe coffee. So that is just something to keep in mind. There are words that we use differently in science um, that the public doesn't use in the same way. And again, this idea of just even the sentence length or the sentence structure and the way it's done in science, scientific publishing versus the lay people is really uh, important. The other thing though that they are asking for these days is these public outreach plans. What are you gonna do to tell the world about what you're doing with this research funding? Well, the good news is there's lots of really way, simple and cheap and free ways to, to do things, even if it's gonna be four years until you have a paper in nature that you can call me about. 
there are things that are called uh, these sort of science outreach nights where you can give a talk about what you do. And, and, and in Ann Arbor, they are abounding, basically. There's one tomorrow night uh, at, uh, well, actually, it's at the, the Hands-On Museum. That's not a speaking um, opportunity. But just people in Ann Arbor really groove on going to events around science, even if they are not in the science world themselves. And so we actually are very lucky to live in an area that there's places to go and give these talks. Um, you can also think about just writing a good description for your website and, and even um, proposing to, uh, to, to, to explain that in a post on this website called The Conversation, which is a really cool website that I really encourage you to check out. Um, it's a platform for academics to publish basically blog posts and explainers and opinion pieces on topics in the news. And I always, always, always encourage you to, to think about your personal profile on LinkedIn, and if you choose to, on Twitter. And I've got some tips out in the back there about Twitter uh, or outside. Um, LinkedIn is great because it actually allows you to post to your own profile little articles, little essays that you write, and that, that you can just write them on that platform and share them. And that could be a public outreach plan. So that's another um, possibility. So the idea of, of the, I call it the Thanksgiving table test, you know, of, of how when you're writing something like one of these lay summaries or even preparing to send something to me saying why you think your nature paper is really awesome, is, is think about explaining it at the Thanksgiving table and assuming that not everybody at that table has a PhD or an MD. And this mm -hmm. idea of, of read it out loud to somebody you know who is not in the science world, you know, actually take that time to practice it. All right, tweeting. Oh, I love this one because we have two kinds of tweeting. One is you as a personal, as an individual, you know, having a voice on Twitter, having a, a, a basically broadcasting to the world as you. And that is awesome. The power of Twitter is incredible. And if you haven't harnessed it, I encourage you to. Um, the idea of, of building your brand by having your real name and a little profile that has a link to your LinkedIn profile or your web page and saying, I am me, I am in science, and I'm going to tweet and retweet things that are interesting to me. I'm going to tweet about my work, but I'm also going to talk to you about work I found in the New York Times or in Scientific American that I think is interesting, or I'm going to tweet interesting papers that I've read. So this idea of building your brand, your personal brand, especially as someone who's early in the career uh, on Twitter is important. But what if your PI says, well, our study, our group or our lab wants to have a Twitter account? And there are some labs that have Twitter accounts and they're pretty cool. And there are some that have tweeted three times and never again. And the big question to ask is how often are you gonna have something to say as a lab, as a center, as a group? Not you as an individual. You as an individual could tweet all day about what you had for lunch. I don't encourage that. You can throw those in once in a while, but mostly tweet about your professional life and things in your professional realm. But you as a lab tweeting, you really have to say, do we have enough of content of our own to sustain this? And if so, what's the best approach for doing that? The content actually may do better if you are suggesting it to us to tweet from the health system or the U of M uh, Twitter accounts and not, you know, not trying to build your own following when you already have 20,000, 30,000, 100,000 followers already eating out of U of M's hand on Twitter. So this idea of suggesting things to us, even if it's, I was just quoted in this trade publication article, as long as that trade publication article is not behind a firewall or a paywall, that means people can't see it unless they subscribe, I would bet you dollars to donuts that we will tweet that. So if you sent me an email today and say, I was quoted in chemical engineering news about this really interesting piece of research we just did. Even if we're not doing a press release, even if it's something that's three years old but is relevant to some new controversy and they called you because they knew that, I will tweet and I'll link to that. And then that gets out there and starts percolating. So that's the idea of, um, of Twitter. So again, this idea for yourself, um, you know, you don't just tweet something once, you can tweet it several times, the same link to say something, but just change up the words that you use in the tweet. Um, there are some great hashtags. If you don't know what a hashtag is, it's basically the way Twitter uses hyperlinked uh, words preceded by the pound sign. So basically on, on Twitter, if you type something with a pound sign and then a word after that, that becomes a hyperlink that then connects you to any other tweet that contains that same pound sign word. And so this idea of using those means people can discover your tweet because if I follow the hashtag diabetes, because I'm in Australia and I study diabetes and somebody from Michigan tweets with that same hashtag, I can see their tweet and I can find it very easily. It's a way of connecting people on Twitter. Uh, and the other idea is just etiquette of retweeting people. If somebody liked what you tweeted enough to, sit, to pass it along, do them a favor some other time and retweet something they sent out. So I'm gonna pipe in, I'm gonna give Kara a second. Um, 
LinkedIn and ResearchGate. How many people here have profiles? LinkedIn first, raise your hands. Ooh, that's good, good, good. good. If good. you don't, set one up. What about ResearchGate? This is a newer one. Oh, so, oh, that's more than I expected. Yeah. Okay, so good. that's good. So those are both areas where you might also consider they're a little more, um, a little more professional, a little Correct. more scholarly. They're sort of outside the realm of social media and they're more in the realm of business social media. So those might be um, channels that you should consider. And then tips and tricks are at um, this website that Kara provided for yeah. us. All right, okay. now we're gonna talk about visuals. So in this day and age on the web, et cetera, it's a visuals matter. Having a picture, having a great video really gets you much further than words alone. And that's me speaking as a writer that wounds me to the core, but it's true. So basically the idea of somebody's gonna take a photo, whether it's you with your iPhone or someone's hired a professional, please, wear your safety gear. You obviously know there's a huge push on safety at the university. We are really, really cracking down on that in our photography as well. If somebody doesn't have their, their glasses on, uh, et cetera, we're not gonna use it. The animal question came up and we can talk a little bit more about that. We actually are very conscious of the fact that we as a university need to show the power of research using animals and what it can achieve. But we also are extremely cognizant, painfully sometimes, of the, the power that people who oppose animal research have over the public attention if they choose to draw attention to something going on at a university like ours. Um, and our university has been in the negative spotlight, if you will, for research, not for things that we consider uh, anything that, that we should be ashamed of. In fact, it was all good work, but because people who oppose animal research chose to seize upon it, it got into the public eye. So we have a special email address that is sort of the all-purpose intake for inquiries about animal research. And, and so uh, basically, if you think you're going to need to do anything involving animals with a video or a photo, other than what you will use in your papers or your professional presentations, uh, then you need to um, connect with us and we'll guide you through it. So for example, we might say, well, if you're doing work that involves ha uh, having a permanent implant in a mouse's brain, We'd prefer that you not show the operation or possibly not even show the implant sticking out of the head of one of those mice, but you might be able to show uh, an image of the cellular processes going on inside that brain. We're totally fine with tissue and cell uh, images from animal work. Images of whole animals, we have to really start talking. We don't want to shine, uh, we don't want to hide the light under a bushel basket of the, what we do here with animals. We know it's an important part of the university's research community. We just need to make sure that what we send out about it or what you all communicated about it does not open you up to the risk of having an activist seize on the image that you've created or the video you've created, take it out of context and use it to make the university uh, a, a target for say a social media campaign or news media publication or news media um, uh, attention. So we wanna make sure that we work with you, especially on images uh, and videos to make sure it's a successful effort. Um, a lot of times you'll have um, people outside of U of M, your professional society wants to do a little video or the NIH wants to send a photographer. Great, you know, totally work with us and we'll make sure that they have the right, you know, directions on where to go and that we're gonna know what they're gonna do with it. And heck, we might like to have a copy of that picture too. Um, obviously if it's me driving and if I'm saying I will hire this photographer and send them to you on Thursday at four o'clock, that's cool, it's all good and we'll just, you know, it'll, it'll work. Even if it's an outside photographer, if I'm hiring them, they are working for the university. Um, there are plenty of uh, folks out there who would love to sell you the opportunity to be in their video. I've seen uh, professional societies, even at their meetings, approach researchers ahead of time and say, would you like to have a video filmed about your work? We'll show it at our meeting on the screens in the lobby of the convention center. And for the low, low price of $15,000, and we go, okay, if you're gonna spend $15,000 on anything, it should not be on making a video. First of all, I can find you a guy to do it for two. And second of all, do you really wanna be on the screens in the convention center? Is that really how you're gonna reach people? Probably not. So run the other way if they're asking for money. So what if you're going to one of these conferences and they're gonna tell the media about your work, what do you do? So definitely, you know, obviously, just as with me, you have the right to ask them to see what they're gonna to put together and to ask them how far in advance they're gonna tell reporters about it, how many reporters, where's it gonna go? And actually, frankly, if you are presenting results that are still preliminary or that you are actually in the midst of preparing a manuscript about, you could, could have the chance of actually scooping yourself if you get media attention now and, and then the journal looks at that and says, well, wait a second, you got media attention for what you did at that meeting. I'm not gonna publish this paper, it's already out there. So you have to be a little bit careful of that. 
professional societies are cognizant of this. You, as long as you stick to what's in your poster or your platform presentation, you're probably okay. But you can also say to the professional society, you know what, I really don't think it's ready. I would rather you not present my stuff to the media yet. And then just like you would be ready for interactions with reporters if I do a press release about you, the same tips apply if you have a reporter walk up to you at your poster or um, email you after your talk, et cetera. And videos. Okay. Okay, take a break. Now I think we're now on to me. Now it's Molly. Uh, yeah, so we have Great. pull up everything. Um, so we have in the, the newly reopened Taubman Health Sciences Library, which you have, if you haven't been over there, it's looking really snazzy. Uh, we have down in the basement a podcast studio uh, that has everything that you would need to create a short video or even a longer video uh, about your lab and about the work that you do. A lot of what we produce is um, sort of course-based materials, educational videos, um, clipped classroom, lecture kinds of things. But we do we do the whole gamut of things. And I think uh, you probably won't be able to hear the audio, Let's but we can, we can switch. Yeah, we show can the just clip. sort of get like a little taste of what's happening. So we've got like the talking head, and then we can have you know any sort of powerpoints that you have, any images that we can build into the video. Um, and we've got all of the editing. I think we also have the ability to do some on-location filming, but I'm not. Don't hold me to that. Um, but if you come to us with video and say we need help getting this edited and put together into like a nice little video that we can use for grants that we can put on YouTube, that's mm -hmm. something that we can that we can help you do. Um, and this okay. one we can just and skip right next. ahead. So the next mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. um, yes. So if you could just pull up all of the text, great. Um, so this is a thing that is happening more and more. You get emails sometimes, maybe every day, multiple times a day, from journals requesting submissions and. How do you tell if a journal is actually legitimate? First of all, if they're emailing you, begging you for submissions all the time, they're probably not legitimate. That's sort of like step one. Uh, but there are there are plenty of journals out there that are legitimate that may be new. So open access publishing is something that's really growing in prominence. And those journals are pretty much all new. They're free online. Um, and in many cases, they're developing higher impact factors. They're great places to publish, but you may not necessarily have heard of them, but they might work for your work. So a few ways to figure out whether or not a journal that you're interested in is actually a place you want to publish is to look them up in a place called Beale's List. So there's a there's a guy, Jeffrey Beale, who's created just a huge alphabetical listing of every journal he's come across that's clearly predatory. There are hundreds of journals on this list. So the first thing you can do is just go there and see, oh, this journal's on the list, forget about it. Um, but it can be it can be hard to spot a predatory journal just from an email because they they use some tricks. Um, so one of the tricks that they use is that they'll use a title that's almost identical to a journal you've actually heard of. So there's the Journal of Women in in Science, and then there's the Journal of Women in the Sciences. And how do you know? Like if you're just scanning, you don't necessarily know. So I actually this happened recently with one of our journals. We um, we're working with Springer, a big scientific publisher, to launch a new open access journal on, called Clinical Diabetes and Endocrinology. Uh, and we had our first, first few articles in this issue. Well, it turns out one of the articles, the authors had submitted it to a journal, um, and then after they'd submitted it, realized that this was not a journal they wanted to be publishing it in, and they withdrew it. They never signed anything. They never paid any fee. The journal published the article anyway, uh, and then it counted as a, a prior publication. And so there's now been all of this struggle because the because Springer wants to retract the article because prior publication is a no-no. You don't it has to be a new article. So this is something you have to really be careful about. This is this this impacts you in all kinds can impact you in all kinds of ways. So you can consult fields list, you can check the impact factor. Um, through the University of Michigan Library here, you have access to the Thomson Reuters um, citation reports and you can figure out what the impact factor is. Um, and that's and those are sort of some of the ways that you can do it. And you know, if if all of that has happened and you're still not quite clear on a journal, you can always come and ask. You can come and ask me. You can contact um, either um, the publishing services in the medical school. If you're not in health sciences, you can contact the library. And there are people who can help you figure out if a journal is legitimate or not. Um, I want to talk a little bit about fees to publish because um, if they ask you for a fee when you submit the article. This is this is a scam, but increasingly all kinds of journals do charge fees for publication. They charge page, they call them page charges, and they're that's not necessarily a sign that a journal is a scam. Uh, especially open access journals, the fees are usually around um, two thousand to three thousand dollars to publish an article. But then that article 
it's really available online from the moment of publication and anyone can get access to it, um, which actually brings us very nicely to my last, my last slide, mm -hmm. um, which is how are you going to increase citations to your work? So you've published, you published an article, it, you know, you, maybe you did a press release, maybe you didn't, but really you want to get this article cited. This is one of the big measures of, of success for an article. Um, the best way to get an article cited is to make sure that people can get to it. Um, so Anne was talking about ProQuest and selling, selling access to libraries um, to all kinds of journal articles. But the fact is, most of the, the premier journals that you're publishing in right now are only available to people who can afford a subscription or people who are affiliated with an institution that can afford a subscription. That is not anywhere near all of the people who are doing work in your field. Uh, so if you want something to get out there, make it freely available online. There are a few ways to do this. Publishing in open access journals, as I've already talked about, um, and then depositing the article into an open repository. So if any of you are funded on an NIH grant, you're legally required to deposit your article in PubMed Central. Um, but even if you're not funded by the NIH, but you have an article that's in the health sciences, you could still deposit that article in PubMed Central and make it freely available online. We also have, oh yeah. I have a question mm -hmm. about that, because I get requests through ResearchGate for mm -hmm. articles, and I just don't know, like, I get nervous to send things because of all the fine print with the journals that yeah. are published with. Like, what are the stipulations on that? That's a great question. So journals have actually changed their rules over the last five or 10 years in response to this, because they used, journals used to take all of your rights right. to the work. Um, but now there's been such demand to be able to share articles online that most journal, journals will permit you to share the PDF in a place like PubMed Central, especially if it's required by the grant, and also in what's called an institutional repository. So here at the University of Michigan, we have Deep Blue. And anyone who's affiliated with the university can deposit their research articles, their books, sometimes even their data into Deep Blue. And then it's really available online and people can find it through Google. Um, and I, I would recommend that to all of you because it's usually when you're Googling around, if something's in deep blue, the PDF just comes up. From, from a searcher's standpoint, they have no idea you know, where it's coming from. They just know, here's this article on a subject that I need. Uh, and the easier it is for people to find your work, again, the more often they will be, they'll cite it. Um, and then also, you mentioned LinkedIn. You can link to your articles directly from LinkedIn. You can put your CV on LinkedIn and have links to your articles from your CV. Um, if you have a personal website or if you have a lab website, put your, put your PDFs there. As many places as you can put the PDFs of your articles where people can get at them, that's going to help you get the word out and make the thing more available. I have a question. Do you know if there are open access credits? So when I was doing my PhD, there were certain journals that gave open access credits to the researchers. Um, yeah, so there are some journals where the University of Michigan has sort of an institutional mm -hmm. subscription. So uh, I think all of the Biomed Central journals, we have an institutional subscription and that will bring down the cost of publishing in them. We used to have an open access fund, so you could apply for, like, for money from the fund to pay for open access fees. I don't think that we do anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, increasingly, we recommend people write that into their grants, uh, and funders are starting to recognize that they need to be able to support open access fees. Okay, so next up, we're going to talk about, um, let's say you've got a workshop or a mini seminar or something that you want your colleagues here on campus to attend. So the first thing I'd encourage you to do is come up with a catchy title and with an abstract or a summary or a description that helps your audience, the people who you want to come to, to your session, understand why it's good for them, what's in it for them. So, you know, tell them what they'll learn, tell them who they'll see. Um, you'll see a world-renowned expert who will tell you how to do X. Um, those are the things to keep in mind when you're coming up. That's what you need to start with. That's sort of your basic building block. Hoping most of the time you have some sort of access to a website, to a channel. So make sure, again, that information, that catchy title that gets up on your website. You either have someone maybe in your department or who's a, who manages the content on your site, or you have, um, you have an outside freelancer who manages your lab's, lab's website. Make sure the most up-to-date information about that event is on your website, because that's really what you're going to be wanting to do is, is channel people um, and, and using people to, to get their information from the website. 
Um, then you need to push information. So if you can make sure that you have a list, who's who you don't you don't want to send an invitation to your very specific scientific, um, let's say it's epigenomics. Let's say you're doing a workshop on epigenomics. You don't want the people uh, at the um, art and design college to get your email about your epigenomics session. That's they're not the people who should be doing who should, who should be hearing about it. So um, really what you should be doing is asking your faculty leader to send out communications via email and make those connections, Le leverage those personal relationships to get people there. Um, and then again, don't feel like you have to take the entire agenda, the entire description of everything that's gonna go on in that session or that workshop that shouldn't go out in those emails, point people to your website, ask them to go and get more information at your website, have them click, hopefully you've set up an RSVP site, maybe using one of our tools like Qualtrics or one of those free tools out there like um, Google Forms, Google Forms or SurveyMonkey. So um, then what are some other things that you can do? So just in terms of the people that we know, there are over 16 different biomedical newsletters here in the health system. And, yeah. and that's just the ones we know about. So submit an article using this form. And again, you guys can have this takeaway. This is a one-stop shopping sort of form where you can drop in your summary and then you can click on each one of those newsletter titles and then you hit submit and that'll send those to the, your article to the editors of all of those different publications. So again, you need to think about what might be appropriate. Like we have, we have Medicine at Michigan on that list. Medicine in Michigan is the alumni. Um, newsletter, you know, the big fancy, I mean, most of us get that, right? Every, it comes out three times a year. You probably don't need your epigenomics event to be in medicine at Michigan, but you certainly want it in research news. You certainly want it in the BRCF newsletter or things like that. So, and then create consistently, do the consistency, take these, the, your title, take your boilerplate, your, your one sentence summary, and make sure that all the people that you work with in your lab and that your leadership have a PowerPoint slide on that. And they can slip it into sessions like this where they can talk about it. Um, another thing that you can do is um, the health system has these things. Does every health system headlines? Do, tell me, who, okay, tell me who reads health system headlines every day. Nobody reads health system headlines every day? Crowd. Man, the crowd. That, that makes me sad because yeah. you know, all right. That crushes me, crushes me to the heart. <laughs> well, Health System Headlines and the main website have these things called shout boxes, which are the little square graphic on the side, and they will they will publish those about your event if you send those, submit those using that article submission form. So then, remember I talked about if you have resources and if you have budget at the very start of our session? If you have the resources and you have the budget, hire a graphic designer to do some snappy design for you on your session. That'll, that'll get you a long way. Um, here at the university, we have Michigan Creative, which is the graphic design and marketing shop that comes out of Central Campus. And then here at the health system, we have Michigan Multimedia, and there are graphic design and um, web, web development shop. Those are both fee-for-service organizations. You do have to give them a short code, but they can help you come up with um, snappy graphics. And, and certainly, you know, lots of us know people Sometimes you have a brother-in-law who's a graphic designer and you can ask them to help you on that sort of thing. So, um, and then the other thing is keep your momentum going. After you have an event, let's say you've brought in a worldwide recognized uh, expert to speak, do a follow-up blurb and send that out via the article submission form as well. And maybe with, um, with some photos that you've taken at the event. Um, you want to sort of keep that that recognition and keep keep your lab or what you're doing at the top of mind of people because that'll help you later on. And it's all Googleable. Uh, that's a good point too. All Googleable. That's hard to say. So um, I've been practicing. This one is um, a, there's been a change in the service that your lab offers. Maybe you have a piece of equipment in your in your lab that um, it is available for other researchers at, to use here. So and you want people to know about this new piece of equipment, or, or maybe there's been a change to how you use it. So again, talk to whoever manages your website and your content and make sure the most current information is up there. Um, this is an example with our cores. They have been launching 
my labs, which is the um, lab management system, the web-based lab management system. So they've been doing a lot of communications on that. So if you have something that the people who use your services need to know, again, make sure it's on your website. This is my number one piece of advice um, that'll help you in, in many ways when it comes to if you have a new service or a new piece of equipment or there's been a change, is do an FAQ, do a frequently asked questions that you get everybody to sign off on. All the, all the people who are experts about that thing or that change, do that FAQ, have it signed off on, make sure that that gets to the users of again, that piece of equipment or your service and then the other great thing about that is, is your own staff can then touch back to that. If there's, you know, if they're having some confusion or they need to drop a piece of verbiage into an email to somebody about the change, um, having an FAQ that has been signed off on by everybody can be really um, important. And then finally, going back to, again, that targeted list, you should have hopefully a user list. Make sure you let them know about the changes. You can submit an article to the biomedical newsletters again, particularly our research news. We are always interested in things that are around changes in services that are available, um, things that are going on with our labs that people need to know about. You can do a lunch and learn like this, and you can have the, the leader, whoever's the leader in your lab or whoever's the expert on that piece of equipment, talk to people about why it's changed or how it's better. Um, and then you can do things like Research Palooza. That's ours too. We love Research Palooza. So now, this is probably, this one and the next tiny case study are the two questions we get asked the most, most often, which is, we got a grant, now we need a website, what do we do? So, um, the first thing, always start with your department. See, see whether you can have a page, see if it's appropriate to have a page on their site, work with them. Um, it might not always be appropriate though to start with your department. Maybe your, your grant is interdisciplinary. Maybe it's you and engineering and the School of Public Health who've, who've collaborated together. And so you need something that's sort of agnostic. So um, there are resources here on campus. Google Sites is one. Um, and then again, we have our, our pay for service organizations like Michigan Multimedia and Michigan Creative. And then you can work with external freelancers. You can always, you know, again, work with folks like that. Um, this is one too that I'm gonna have Amy talk about. She knows a little bit more about this, the possibility of using somebody who are students. Sure, so um, prior to my role here at the medical school, I was in a grant funded organization in the School of Education and, you know, grant funded, didn't have a lot of money and we needed some help in developing a website. So there is a program through the School of Information, it's called Community Impact Project. Um, there's their website there. You can go and, um, you know, submit your projects, like a brief summary, what you're looking for. And they have undergraduate students, um, primarily, sometimes it's graduate students, who can come and consult with you, whether it's, you know, a single day. We had to come in a couple of different sessions as we were planning our website to give us some advice, or all the way up to a full term. Um, generally, their parameters are, you know, your nonprofit, which obviously we meet. Um, there's some sort of community um benefit to what you're doing so i would i would encourage you to check out them um you know even if it's not through that program there's also students who are almost always looking to get experience um you know that are also probably willing to help out so this one is um similar to the website this is a question we get all the time is um, we need to collaborate with some other organizations we need a, an online a web-based collaboration space so um here on campus some of our resources are M plus box or M box. We are in love with M box right now. We, we love it, we use it. It's great for file sharing and it's super easy to use. Um, it's secure, you know, it's, and you can access it from wherever you want and wherever you need to be. So um, another option is Confluence. Confluence is more a sort of a traditional wiki. It's been around longer. Um, the pro to Confluence is that you can tie it an M community group. So if you've got 20 people who are collaborating, you just link it to Confluence as opposed to something like Mbox, where those 20 people, you would have to invite them individually. So, um, and then uh, another possibility is um, Google Sites. And Google Sites is sort of website meets file sharing service. So it's sort of um, a, a blend of the two and Again, super easy to use. 
If you have questions about MBOX, we have, we've put Mary Beth's name on here. Those folks are on Central Campus ITS, super easy to work with. She'll help you on anything, any questions regarding MBOX and then any other sort of technical aspects of collaboration space here within the health system and the medical school, you should contact MSIS. So this brings us, we've, that wraps up our tiny, tiny case studies. I'm going to start wrapping things up here a little bit. We've presented you with a lot of information. Most of what we have talked about is on the research project route map at what we call the communication station. And if you click on the communication station, that's going to take you to this page. And again, if you navigate through this resource, so for instance, you click on that and it's internal audiences, you can click on that one and it's external audiences, you're going to see sort of drop down lists of a lot of the, the processes and the resources that we've talked about. This you can access anywhere, anytime, any device. Um, we also have as a resource, and this one is behind the firewall. This is a similar tool that the um, Office of Communications yeah. at the Health System Cares Group that they maintain, a similar resource as well. So sort of a how-to, you know, again, you see called out there logos, templates, um, things like that. This one, however, it is behind the firewall, so you need to be on a campus network con uh, connection to access that as of right now. So um, finally, wrapping things up, just want to talk to you again a little bit about measuring your success. And again, sort of survey, Survey your colleagues and your leadership. Use Google Analytics. Almost all of the web-based tools that we talked about, whether it was, it was um, Google Sites or any of those tools, they have analytics embedded, so you can look and see what your traffic is. You can set up alerts. You can set Google Alerts are super easy to set up. So you just go in and you type, you know, maybe it's the name of your paper, maybe it's your name. You set it in, up in Google Alerts, and you will either daily or weekly receive notifications if you are mentioned anywhere on the web. Um, and then of course, you know, if, you, if you're having events, make sure you get all the contact information of the people who come to your events. Make sure they register, make sure you're keeping their email addresses and you can use it to follow up. And then follow up afterwards and see if they were satisfied with their event. So wrapping things up, yeah. turning it over, Kara, so, one last I, time. I covered uh, some of this already, but again, go back from this session, I hope, and look at your LinkedIn presence and make sure you, you know, described yourself well. Don't just give your current title, but say what you are. I am a scientist who studies X. Um, and also think about joining groups or following um, pages for institutions that you are from or are, you know, trained at or that you would like to work at or professional societies you're a member of. Um, and then just keep posting to your profile and, and share things on LinkedIn because especially as you're entering the, the job search uh, world, you know, you're definitely going to want to connect with people there. And also, if someone Googles you, LinkedIn has incredible Google juice and that will come up, you will come up in um, their search, your LinkedIn page will come up very high. So you have to make sure that what they're seeing about you is up to date, accurate and professional. Similarly, we, uh, we talked a little about Twitter professionally and sharing uh, things and then also if there is a way for you to have a page with a nice picture of yourself, not the one of you on the beach 12 years ago, on your lab website or your own personal site, there's plenty of tools. You could make a Google Sites about yourself. Um, if you use the U of M Google web space and then you leave the university, I'm not quite sure how that travels with you. You probably keep, get to keep it in some way. But mm -hmm. so you might want to think about also, do you want to, you know, buy a domain name that is your name? I mean, you can do that. You can go buy a domain name that is johnqsmith.org if it's available or the .com. Um, you may not need to go quite that level, but just make sure that you have a good bio on the lab website of the lab you belong to. So we have run a little bit over. Um, I want to thank Molly and Kara so much for everything. So um, I I know I have time to stick around. Do, do people have questions? Anything? Do we want to go more into the animals question at all? Well, let's. Yep. Go ahead. We had someone yep, raise their hand, and then we can. Actually, like, kind of two questions. Sure. Um, the first is I've really started noticing like some of my colleagues and peers, kind of in the early stage investigator um, area starting to like write blog posts or have their research um, mentioned and have them post. So I don't know if that's the type of thing that you need to pin on or like how do you get into how people post? Not necessarily, I've yeah. I've really seen that. Right. It's showing up a lot on 
Facebook and you know, things like Those that. people, yeah. So, I mean, having to post takes submissions, and there's a web form you can say, I really like the blog on this. And, and if they're interested, they'll let you know. And that's something, like, something you can try. There are gobs and gobs of sites of blogs. I mean, if you follow some blogs, contacting them to say, hey, I'd love to write, try writing a post for you. Are you open to that? And if so, what's my length? What's my tone? What's my audience? You know, asking them some basic questions, or just having read the blog, you can see what they're they're doing. There are some new um, science writing blogs starting up uh, on campus here, but the you know this idea of there are many many platforms, and it's a great way to practice writing in a more general style and tone. Um, and so yeah, I do encourage that for sure. You want to talk more about animal stuff? Yeah, I think um, the other thing besides that email address that I mentioned, uh, we have a page. So the U of M. Uh, VP for Research uh, has a website uh, about animal research. This is animal.research.umich.edu. And on there, um, we have a lot of information about animals at U of M. But we also have on that DIY site that, uh, that was the last thing you showed, there is a page there about communicating if you use animals in your research. So there's a lot more guidance online there. So I really encourage you to check that out.